Welcome to the Heart 360 Innovation Video Series, prepared by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Qualities, Healthcare Innovations Exchange. These videos are part of Million Hearts, a Department of Health and Human Services national initiative aimed at preventing one million heart attacks and strokes over the next five years. This is one of two videos that focus on the Heart360 Innovation, a program involving home blood pressure monitoring that uses the Heart360 online reporting system developed by the American Heart Association. Dr. David McGid developed and implemented the Heart360 Innovation in Kaiser Permanente, Colorado. Dr. McGid is Director of Research for the Colorado Permanente Medical Group and an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Preventative Medicine at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. The Heart360 Innovation was one of several programs featured in a Million Hearts event in April 2012. The Million Hearts Initiative invited prominent healthcare thought leaders and stakeholders to Washington, D.C. to inspire creative thinking about scaling and spreading cardiovascular prevention activities throughout the United States. Dr. Carolyn Clancy, Director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and Dr. Thomas Frieden, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, inspired and motivated attendees to achieve the Million Hearts goal. Throughout the day, the attendees shared real-world success stories about service delivery innovations shown to improve blood pressure and cholesterol control. Attendees also brainstormed ideas to scale and spread these and other innovative approaches to better heart health. At the meeting, Dr. McGid provided an overview of the Heart360 program, addressed issues central to scaling, including implementation challenges, and then forecasted the return on investment. A reactor panel of experts representing different stakeholder perspectives then commented on the feasibility of the program's spread. This reactor panel included Nancy Artinian, Associate Dean for Research and Director of the Center for Health Research at Wayne State University, speaking from the perspective of a cardiovascular disease provider and specialist. Mary Ann Elma, Director of Quality Innovation and Implementation at the American College of Cardiology, commenting from the perspective of a spread agent. Veronica Goff, the Vice President of the National Business Group on Health, commenting from the perspective of a healthcare purchaser. Bruce Siegel, President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Association of Public Hospitals and Health Systems, speaking from the perspective of a purchaser and potential adopting organization. And Lisa Simpson, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Academy Health, reacting from a policy perspective. Let's begin with a brief overview of this presentation. The Heart360 program offers medication therapy management to patients who record their home blood pressure measurement three to four times each week in the American Heart Association's Heart360 system. Pharmacists monitor and review these measurements, modify medication therapy, and consult with the patient on lifestyle changes as needed. The Heart360 program improved blood pressure control for Heart360 participants. Participants were more satisfied with their care when compared to patients not in the program. The program has the potential to save millions of dollars each year. A 10-year forecast demonstrates a savings of $20 million annually. Let's take a look as our innovator and experts talk about scaling and spreading the Heart360 innovation. Part 1 of this video series focuses on the core elements of the innovation evidence for the innovation's effectiveness, its potential for adaptation to other settings, and facilitators and barriers that must be considered when spreading this innovation.
we were led to think about, about what are the really essential elements of this. I think when, when you think about spreading something, uh, an intervention in a complex system, if you can break it down into what's called simple rules or minimum specifications, what are the four or five or three or six basic principles that if you put these principles in, in place, it works? Local modifications to fit those principles are then okay. And so I really believe when you're asking me about the components that are important, um, it is mar it's marrying the home blood pressure with a system to get the blood pressure readings to someone who can look and, and, and act on it and make sure that the, that the blood pressure readings are stored in that cuff and all transmitted to you so that you don't have selective readings. We know that if you just give people a blood pressure cuff, that that will not lead to either any or, or much improvement in care. So we know that. And also we know that you need to figure out a system whereby that can be done easily with a patient. Certainly we know that the weight of the evidence is an important to an adopter and positive outcomes certainly lead mm -hmm. the way for spread. We have no knowledge about the duration of the effects of the intervention beyond six months. Um, and more importantly, I wondered if there's other evidence that you might have in terms of other outcomes. Are there important modifiers to uh, the effects of this intervention? Does this intervention differ by race, sex, gender, socioeconomic sure. status? Um, also, might there be other outcomes to take a look at, like decreased number of health care visits or uh, increased medication adherence? So okay. can you talk a little bit more about the evidence? So I think in terms of the weight of the evidence, um, mm -hmm. uh, this is not the only study that's been done in home mm -hmm. blood pressure monitoring. First thing we know is that if you just give someone a home blood pressure cuff the, uh, um, and see, see what happens, we know that the effect of that is either negative or very small. So we know uh, multiple studies that have done that. Uh, our study falls into a second group of studies where patients were given a home blood pressure cuff, but it was part of a more coordinated system where there was kind of a provider who, who reviewed those. And there have been multiple studies um, like that, and it, almost every one of them are positive and positive to the same degree. So I think the weight of evidence of the benefits of um, blood pressure of, of home blood pressure monitoring where it's uh, with support of a provider um, are, are, are strongly positive and very clear. So I think we can put that aside. The weight of the evidence is plenty good. Uh, most of those studies though are of short duration. Ours was six months. The longest ones are really about, most of them are 12 months. I think there may be one that's at two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we certainly don't have any studies that, you know, go out to like five or ten years or something like that, and I'm not sure we ever will. Um, uh, so uh, that was the first question. I think the second question, within our study and in most studies, the mm -hmm. results have been positive within subgroups. I think in terms of the sort of uh, mediators of the effect, uh, the mediators appear to be twofold. One uh, is treatment intensification, so recognition that people have elevated blood pressure and taking actions on behalf, increasing medications or you know, diet and exercise. Uh, and the other effect is, is through uh, improved adherence to therapy. So both of those, both in our study and other studies, have been shown to be important mediators. Most of the studies uh, you know, are good, as the ARC review says, um, but it hasn't gone from studies context to sort of large spread of creating an evidence base on multiple settings and whether it's pharmacist-led, HBPM, or provider-led, et cetera. So Medicare is increasingly using uh, its coverage with evidence development policy. Mm -hmm. And this is a policy that says, okay, we'll pay for the service as long as you collect XYZ extra data to create a broader evidence base for us before we determine that we'll actually pay for this long term. So I wondered if that had come up at all because uh, um, while I, I believe the evidence base is, is robust, as you've said, it's still in limited settings and not widespread. The same kind of model could be in a patient-centered medical home uh, with some kind of, of uh, global payment or some other, some different yep. payment than fee-for-service or in an ACO using other people. And, and I've heard Henry Ford, for example, uses panel managers. Panel managers could review blood pressures. If they're abnormal, they pass it along the nurse practitioner or PA. That's the way it's done. So I would look at this model as being, you know, not just the, the way you did it, but lots of different variations 
with the key things of using home blood pressure measurement, um, having rapid response and, and intensification where needed, and a payment system that rewards that kind of behavior. Um, yeah, hopefully. I would totally agree with that. I mean, obviously, uh, we'd use pharmacists other people, I mean, one of the reasons why we use pharmacists is because in the state of Colorado, pharmacists can actually make medication changes uh, that don't need to be signed off, you know, by a physician, and that's one of the reasons why we did it. But people have used other types of providers, and I couldn't agree with you more, as, as well as your suggestion about the payment. Until we change that, I don't think it's going to work in a fee-for-service system. And it's the Clayton Christensen idea of, of, of trying to move down on the breakthrough innovation curve of, of finding someone less expensive, more accessible. Right. Uh, so, so you're always looking for other other ways of doing things that are less expensive and more accessible, and whatever that is, a pharmacist, a nurse, a, a, a trained volunteer, even uh, perhaps in some in some cases. Well, and one and one um, just real quick one thing that uh, there was a study in uh, Great Britain where they actually had patients making changes hmm. themselves. Yeah. You know, sort of yeah. like wow. setting out a plan and saying, you know, if your blood pressure continues to be elevated, we want you to double the dose or we want you to, here's a prescription, I want you to fill this new medicine. So, yeah. you know, this is not rocket science and uh, you don't need to be a physician to do this stuff. When I look at your model, I see a huge potential for low-income populations who are, you know, in working families who can't take off a day or half a day to go to the doctor. Uh, and, you know, and perhaps wait longer than they'd like um, to actually see the physician. And so the impact of your model could be really big for people of low income, uh, for ethnic and racial minorities who have very high rates of hypertension and heart disease and everything else. So my question, have you thought about that explicitly and have you sort of looked at the impact on populations in, in your practice? So the regular cuffs that we sell in our pharmacy cost about $30 to $35. They're simple blood pressure cuffs. Uh, they don't have a USB adapter. The cuff that we used in this study cost $58. So uh, a health plan like ours would need to think very carefully. If we want patients to use these more expensive cuffs, then we're probably going to need to subsidize them. We're not going to, because if you just ask patients, they're probably not going to want to spend the extra money for a more expensive cuff the issue of patient turnover, uh, and uh, it, it harkens back to that economic analysis from at least from the perspective of the, of the payer. Um, if, if, if you're my member today and I initiate you on home blood pressure monitoring and I improve your blood pressure, but the benefits accrue down the line, uh, you, know, you know, three, five, eight, ten years from now, well, with turnover rates uh, within health plans today, some of them reach as high as 30 percent. You know, so um, for those high turnover health plans, they may say, well, that person's not going to be in my health plan. I don't believe that economic analysis. It's not. It's more from a societal perspective, not from mine. I think the cost argument is just going to be a problem for this, and I think it's in part because of the balkanization, uh, right? So you've got uh, you're going to have some upfront costs, you know, paying for more expensive blood pressure cuffs, you know, reach, you know, the resources of change and so forth, and the benefits and the long-term benefits of like heart attack, stroke, and so forth. But while it's clearly very important to the people here at this meeting, it's um, it's it's hard to argue that the the organization that implements that will really ever see that benefit themselves. Right. A Kaiser-specific challenge is, was getting this data into our electronic health record. We have an EPIC-based electronic health record. It's easy to get data out. For security reasons, very hard to get data in. As a result, the pharmacists who did this had to work really in two systems. We, had to, we worked with our own sort of homegrown um, tracking system called HealthTrack, as well as the electronic health record record. That's a dissatisfier for providers to have to use two systems instead of just one. One of the things that's always concerned me is that the, the system as it now exists um, requires that you have access to a computer with internet access. And one of the things that I, I think I mentioned that could really make, in my mind, a big difference is if we could figure out a system that wouldn't, didn't require having a computer but that you could actually use your cell phone. There's no real reason that a system like this couldn't be developed where you could actually use Bluetooth or other sort of cellular transmission technologies. And, and I, you know, when you look at the proportion of people who have cell phones, um, it's much higher. And, and particularly in low SES community, it's considerably higher. So that 
Um, I mean, and, and not just in the United States, but if you think about the world, even in the third world, a lot of people have cell phones and that technology, but they don't have computers. So that would be one thing that I think would make a big difference towards addressing the gap. And you're absolutely right, you know, um, we know that a lot of racial ethnic groups have higher rates of hypertension and higher rates of cardiovascular outcomes, and so it could probably have a, even a greater impact there. When we started the project, there, uh, there was a, a woman, Dr. Jennifer Jeans, who was the head of hypertension in Colorado, and she was very uh, much our, our, our champion along with us uh, as, as the researchers in the project, and she's very excited. Um, unfortunately, for family reasons, she had to leave in the middle of the project. Um, and since then, we've actually had, we're now on our fourth head of the hypertension program since uh, she was there. And so the person now, you know, who's in it, you know, has come in uh, after the project, was never involved in the project at all. And so not that they're not generally supportive, but there's a difference between kind of being generally supportive and sort of getting on your horse with your sword in your hand and marching into battle. And we don't have someone like that at this time. I don't think we did as good a job in bringing together the sponsorship we need. So in some ways, um, having to do this presentation kind of reignited me a little bit to sort of go back and kind of figure out the story of what happened, but also start to bring these things in place. And I think that um, at least in terms, I think we've had some meetings again with senior leadership and I think we're bringing together, we've brought together now the sponsorship that we need to do. When we started this project, blood pressure control in Kaiser, Colorado wasn't that good. We were not at the top in terms of the nation. And there were a lot of initiatives that were done and now we are, are very much at the top. And so there, it's not seen as quite the priority that it was uh, when we started the project. And in an organization in our size, which is you know, a little more than half a million people, uh, we have a limited bandwidth to do big projects. So the idea of taking this project and saying, well, we're going to fundamentally change how we manage hypertension and move it from an office-based model to a home blood pressure model, that requires a lot of, of resources and energy to do that. And with a number of other priorities that we have, it's just not on the list as, at the top. For more information on this and other innovations, please visit AHRQ's Healthcare Innovations Exchange website at innovations.ahrq.gov. To learn more about the Million Hearts Initiative, visit millionhearts.hhs.gov.